previously on X-Men. Hey guys, welcome back to our exploration, or I guess our discussion of the X ongoing X-Men 97 series. I'm your co-host, Mick, and I'm joined by... Tyson. Awesome, welcome. And we're back. We're exploring this kind of monumental series from our childhood, which is turning into kind of a big deal nowadays. So it's kind of exciting. Yeah, it kind of feels like um, this... We need the X-Men back, and... Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a big series. Might be one of the big uh, TV shows of this year. Yeah, um, uh, it's definitely going on my watch list of our year end wrap up already. So. No, I, I think it's done incredibly well. It's taking that uh, mythos, the kind of cheesiness of the '90s cartoon, right, where they were limited uh, from networks, obviously, and what you can show children to giving it a PG thirteen rating, cranking up the intensity a little bit, and it is reminding me a lot of some of the other animated series that we've seen, similar to like it's getting pretty close to like Invincible. Uh, one of those kind of brutal series, right, that was kind of uh, criticized, or not criticized, um, praised for its brutalness uh, and its honesty and its deep storytelling. And we're kind of getting that with our lovable Marvel characters. And I think Marvel, at least the animated team on this, was showing that this this show can be just as, like, X-Men are just as dark and deep as all these other stories. Like, oh, the boys, oh, what a dark take on superheroes. No, no, the X-Men have always kind of been about as dark as, like, the boys are in Invincible. We've just got a watered-down version in cartoons and uh, movies. Very, right? very much so. Very much so. Like, the X-Men die all the time. It's kind of uh, a rule mm -hmm. for, uh, like, a kind of thing. So, I mean, they're kind of the OG on this one. Um, I'm a huge... Uh, I'm, I'm really digging it. I think that this episode was a big stepping stone because everybody was mm -hmm. kind of what... Uh, last episode, there was a little bit, a little some rumblings uh, from the crowd, which was, you know, fair considering yeah, it's sure. a two parter or whatever. But this one was a uh, who boy hit hard, hit hard. If you have not, uh, I'll just it. we're spoiling everything. So if you got past this point, chances are we're probably spoiling something. If you haven't watched the series yet, do yourself a favor, go back it's a couple episodes. It'll take an hour and a half, and you'll be like, oh my gosh, you'll be dialed right in. It'll be an awesome experience for you, but. We are spoiling things here today, so you've been warned. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, you know, so buckle up, kids. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think the way we're kind of do this is we're going to do a little bit of a review. So we're going to uh, quick intro. We're going to review kind of the episode, kind of beat by beat, what we liked, what we didn't like. Give it a little mini review, and then we're going to rank our five favorite X Men from this episode. So pretty excited to see how I get Beast more points this week. Yeah, I'm going to be really surprised at your list. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm guilty of throwing some of my favorite. When I when I give five anyways. points to Sauron because of Jubilee's uh, random throwaway of vampire dinosaurs, I was like, oh yeah, Sauron was a vampire dinosaur. Cool. All right, five points done. Boom. Yep. Yep. You, you nailed it. You yeah. nailed it. There you go. Um, Tyson's favorite little guy. So uh, starting off right off the top, though, we see a reporter visiting the X Men for some good PR as the mutant nation of Genosha is about to get in inducted into the UN. I think she has a little bit of a rapport with Beast, and apparently from the comics there is some type of a relationship with Beast and this said reporter. So I don't know if we'll see that in the show, but we get a little bit of uh, casual flirtation between the two. Right, right. Um, but but um, opening, um, we got a cable scene, we get a Callisto and Storm sighting, and then we get a Nightcrawler and Gambit scene. So... A oh, couple little added in I'm sorry. parts of the opening. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about that. So opening, like, it, it changes every week, right? We've seen yep. Jean Grey from, or Madeline, in the first couple episodes with her flowing hair, to all of a sudden now Jean has a ponytail, because Jean Grey wears a ponytail. Uh, we get additional scenes, and I was a little bit more harsh, and actually, I'll apologize to you right now, on the last episode, where I was kind of like, no, you're looking into things, quit doing this. Because I've watched other Disney Plus shows... And I know how disappointing they are. I know the expectations that people come in and they're like, oh, we're going to get Daredevil in in Hawkeye and it's going to be awesome. And then you get your final reveals and everything's over and everyone's like, this sucks. 
I've watched Book of Boba that fat. I know how terrible Disney Plus shows could be. So that's what I was trying to do. I that's was trying fair. to hamper those expectations because I've 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 been a part of these conversations. I've been a part of the communities that watch these shows that discuss them in uh, like nauseum, and there's usually just pain and disappointment. So that's what I was trying to get at. Um, previously, it was like just keep your expectations somewhat low because there is a chance that the show disappoints you. Right. That that's all I was trying to get across there. I mean, this episode was beyond my wildest dreams of what I could expect and I think where they're going to go. And I think we're going to see some really, really cool stuff, right? Um, but just that was kind of more of my, uh, my point from oh, last for time. Sure. It's just like, uh, just watch. No, yeah. And that's it's fair to be skeptical because skeptical, it's like, you know, as up, up to that point, it's like we were kind of getting a by-the-numbers nostalgia romp, which mm-hmm. was fair. Um, this episode, Rip the Band-Aid Off, definitely makes a dark turn. Um right. But I think that we need kind of this monumental shift. Um, and I think it, from the casual observer, they're probably giving the show more legitimacy now as opposed to, oh, it's just like, you know, it's kind of fun like the old ones. It's like, no, no, there's, this series might be something really special. And I'm really happy that Disney is actually going for it and doing something risky. Like this is a kid's cartoon show. Um, well, it's PG-13, but it's still like, cartoon show so even most adults aren't probably gonna be like after a certain Mm -hmm. point they're probably not gonna want to watch a cartoon but um for us who've watched this stuff and are a big fan of the franchise or and i I even say to the casual people like give it a shot honestly it's so good i'm trying to talk about it with with everybody and trying to Mm -hmm. be like hey give it a give it a watch trust me yeah no Um, it's it's stepped up a little bit now uh, maybe harper expectations again i i'm saying it, we can't have fun but there is a point where you get too excited and you might get disappointed by this project right think of any of the disney shows that have come out in the past so as long as we have like proper expectations now i'm i'm not into the ahsokas the bad batches the clone wars right that disney plus has also done so maybe they do have some parts that are like very satisfying for fans i i just know the projects i've been a part of and followed in the past usually leave something be desired right so but so far they're doing well right so back to the episode uh we see the reporter at the mansion talking to the x-men that's kind of our conduit to that team uh meanwhile magneto rogue and gambit travel to the mutant nation of genoa uh Geno- Gen- genosha uh we meet nightcrawler and the i guess pair of robot rogue gambit and with their buddy nightcrawler uh, explore the streets they discuss some ten dollar apples and we see just kind of, I don't know, we get like a little bit of back and forth about Rogue and Gambit's relationship. So, we've got to see why our, our, our pal Nightcrawler, the jovial, poofy man. Yes, yes. You know, uh, always brings a very happy, carefree guy. Can't wait to catch up with his, his friends. And yeah. he's giving them kind of a semi-tour. We see some um, younger fan favorites kicking around, like Glob, Pixie, Leech. Um, a couple other little characters running around. I have an Easter eggs list, so I'll run through that near the end. But okay, cool. um, I, I have multiple lists um, <laughs> of things because it's like it, it's got a good pace to it, but it's kind of seems a little bit by the numbers to to the start. Yes. So, um, but we get to explore Genosha, and then we get to go visit with the council. I believe did that. Yeah, I guess. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so then we find out that they are they brought Magneto and his X Men to, to Genosha because they want to kind of give him the leadership role, right? They call it a king. I think they finally say that we want to call it a chancellor. So the leader of Genosha. Uh, we get to the council. We see Banshee. We see Maura McTavish as kind of a, an human affiliate fill into the team. We see the Black King, the White Queen, Emma Frost as well as Callisto making up the Council of Mutants. Yeah, and Madeline Pryor's there. Oh, that's right, because they needed, um, yeah. They wanted an uh, an X-Men, and they just happened to have an extra gene kicking around. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of kind of funny jokes. Uh, Emma Frost does call out, why is a a human on our council? Well, you know, she's she's always been a very adamant, you know, advocate for mutants. Mm -hmm. They're like, "Mm mm-hmm, sure, sure she has. Yeah. But um, I have a bunch of side tangents. I won't go into it with that character. So Okay, cool. Uh, so from there, we cut back to Cyclops breaking down on camera and giving just an absolute, just terrible interview. He's got no PR. 
Uh, they kind of get to a point where he's discussing things and they say, well, how's the baby? We, we, we heard we saw some medical records. You guys have had a baby recently. And he's like, I don't have a child. Could just be like, oh, he didn't make it. There were some complications. He's passed away. And they'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, discussing your dead baby. No, but like she just keeps hounding him because he's weird about it. Yeah, well, she's she she's also not like she has has the grace of a brick through a plane of glass. It, like she's not. It's just such an awkward. Oh, but I talked to the doctors. Yeah. and I had the medical record saying that you had a baby, and it's like clearly don't want to talk about this. Yeah, um, I actually really like this this scene with Scott. Um, he has a great little line about like you. Yeah, you know I am lying because we aren't like you. Yeah. In all honesty, it's like. And you're lucky for it, because if we were like you, you wouldn't be here. And you're like, damn, dropping truth bombs, Scott, love you, this is good shit. It's just not great PR. Uh, meanwhile, at this point, though, mm. Jean, it, we find Jean is hiding in the lake, trying to play around with her memories, right? Memory is a big big part of this episode, it's called Remember It. We're supposed to yes. remember it, that's obviously clearly what it is. So Jean's trying to figure out all her memories, trying to figure out which is her, who's Madeline. Uh, Wolverine comes and confronts her, and they end up actually having a little bit of an intimate kiss. Wolverine gets to have the titular little line. He says, hey, it's okay. You're Jean Grey. He's Scott Summers. Them's the rules. You just forgot it for a second, and then gruffly walks away. Yep, yep. So, uh, very, very very, interesting. Jean just randomly kissing Logan. Yeah, yeah it's odd. Uh, we do see Cyclops uh, and Jean kind of being comforted afterwards and just talking about what they went through, what Nathan meant. Uh, how are they kind of dealing when holy no actually it was madeline this whole time so in the astral plane madeline is confronted cyclops and they're having a cute little cuddle session gets caught by jean gray which leads to a, a, a basically a conversation about who do you love do you love me do you love my clone uh get out this relationship's over we're seeing a lot of tension between this kind of these two lovebirds of the x-men as all of a sudden something flashes in her brain and she mentions something's going on with Madeline. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing good when stuff like this happens. No, no, so. not, not, not. I mean, sure, nothing bad will happen afterwards. Uh, the one stipulation that Magneto has for becoming the Chancellor of Genosia is he wants to be able to rule with Rogue. So he says, I want Rogue to come in, be my queen. She's part of the X-Men. She's a very empathetic character. And I think the two of us, my strength, her empathy, can help be a great leadership. Also... Rogue at this point reveals that back before she joined the X-Men, sometime when she was training before she took Miss Marvel's powers, she spent some time with Magneto just learning about his philosophies in the Savage Land. So we see kind of her classic attire from the comic books. Uh, he's even painting her in uh, the similar attire. Uh, and because of his electromagnetic abilities, they're able to have some type of physical relation. Yep, yep, and for Rogue, that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and then she leaves because his, um, would she say something along the lines of, like, his demons were too big for us? Yeah, the, between his demons oh. and his problems, it was just, it was too much. So they kind of broke yeah. it off. He pretended like it never happened, uh, and only recently he's kind of discussed bringing it back. Gambit says he does love her, but because they can never touch, she's just never going to be able to feel his spark. Gambit replies with well some things are greater than are, are deeper than skin yep yeah right. uh, so at the gala uh, in genosha uh, magneto is discussing i believe with what's it called val the un person valerie cooper valerie cooper Boo. um sebastian shaw and emma frost and he's just kind of discussing as we get to hear a great rendition of asa bases What's it called? Like save the world or safe world or something like that. Something like that. I'm not I'm not a ace of base expert. Yeah. To be honest. Uh, so she comes in. Uh, Bengito joins her in the air. They have kind of a public display of affection. They hold hands. They kiss. But Rogue ultimately declines his offer, saying that choosing Gambit ultimately over Bengito, saying that some things are deeper than skin. At that moment, though, we do see Madeline all of a sudden require uh, have a, a similar psychic blast or something hit her head similar to what happened to Jean earlier in the episode. She stumbles outside where all of a sudden we hear Cable, our man Cable, little Nate Summers is already grown up. He's already big boy. He's running in yelling, shut the music off, get everyone out of here. As he runs to Madeline, they have kind of a moment where the, he, she realizes, oh, my God, Cable is my son. You did make it. You're alive. Uh, until... 
Cable's armband temporarily goes to send him back, and he goes, oh, damn, he's coming, get out of here, I'm sorry, mother, as he's pulled into the fuse, uh, yeah. pulled back into he the says, future. Not again. Not again, as a giant explosion rocks the gala. Huge explosion, giant green flash, boom. Boom. Um, and it's just, like, deafening, man, and it, uh, crazy, crazy stuff, um, Shit's about to get real, real. Yeah, the last um, twenty-two or first twenty-two minutes of this episode seem pretty standard affair for a cartoon. You're thinking pol- politics, balls, uh, interpersonal drama of the X Men, pretty standard future stuff. Future Geno- Genosha, what's it gonna look like? Look like now that's literally a recognized place from the UN. Uh-huh. This is literally that celebration. Yeah, we're, and then uh, yeah. this giant blast uh, we see from Rogue's point of view, getting the blast, recovering kind of shaking it off and apparently a giant kaiju sentinel has yeah, landed th- on three-headed mo- beast that's literally like dropping full-size sentinels in huge um like it it has thousands of these sentinels mm-hmm. like a, a regular sentinels are just dropping out of this thing and invading genosha it's crazy uh quickly rogue and magneto uh, are in the line of one of the big green blasts from this monster nightcrawler has, uh, has heroically is able to teleport them away to safely uh, towards the gardens where Gambit comes in, checks on Nightcrawler. We find out that he has survived, but there has been some casualties. looks like Sebastian Shaw, the Black King, Callisto uh, have both succumbed to their injuries. I think Banshee also gets hit by a black pre- or blast pretty much dead on. So he's probably eliminated. And yeah, yeah he's carrying marrow or somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't actually write that one down, but okay. Uh, so with that blast, uh, we kind of get a rallying cry of uh, the Morlocks are stuck underneath the beast's belly. Let's try and save them. So Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit kind of set off to save the Morlocks and kill the Kaiju Sentinel. Uh, yep. They get to the point where they can rescue them. Magneto uh, is pinned down with the Morlocks underneath one of the big green blasts as Rogue and Gambit look on helplessly as Magneto whispers in German to Leech. Do not be afraid. As the blast seemingly kills the leader of the X Men, and I was like, "Wow, I can't believe they just killed Magneto. That's crazy." Yeah, yeah. Well, and leading up to this, as they're rushing in, like Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit are rushing in. Magneto has a great little line of like, um, "We're not gonna like let this day go, knowing that we didn't g- give everything we could to save." them yeah we won't have any regrets about what our efforts did to save people like let's go all out yeah. right yeah it's um, like no 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 holding back today it's like this is fucked he's mm-hmm. pissed um so to see him like go down trying to save the morlocks because it does cut to the morlocks and they're like mm-hmm. um i think it's tommy one of the morlocks of the chick with the rainbow hair says to leech is like they're not coming like yeah we're we're, we're done like we're fine. The X-Men don't care um, about the Morlocks as Gambit flies through the window uh, window in the building that they're trapped in on a sentinel head and says, come on, guys. I'm here to save you. Yep. Where yep. you go, Tommy. Dummy. Idiot. Idiot. Uh, from there, we see Rogue in a rage flying off to destroy or wanting to avenge her ex-lover's death. Gambit uh, uh, takes her out by crashing uh, an exploding motorcycle into her to uh, save her from the blast. And before the Sentinel can turn and kill what looks like to be a bunch of the survivors, including Nightcrawler, Gambit heroically charges up his bow staff, makes a rush attack, and as he's flying towards the Sentinel, he gets stabbed into the side and eliminated. Before that, though, as he's dying, he has a little smirk on his face. He gets to say his titular line, I'm not just a mutant, I'm Gambit. Remember it. As he psionically charges up the sentinel creating a giant explosion destroying the kaiju saving genosha but ultimately sacrificing himself in the process there's a giant blast and the final episode or the episode ends with the devastation being shown to the x-men the the x-men looking just utterly shocked and destroyed as rogue catches or clutches gambit's dead body and we hear her eagerly say gambit i can't feel you End. yep yep damn and then we get a we don't get a triumphant like credits mm-hmm. just the gloom. sad the sad x-men theme on a piano yeah and then um and it doesn't even because it goes through it's like little animation of clicking through all the characters yeah. and it tells you a little thing about it. it it literally ends before it would get to magneto because it, it always goes does in the same order 
oh, okay, does it? Okay. I, <laughs> I thought it clicked all the way yeah. through, and I was like, damn, this is uh, heavy, heavy. Because well, the original would do that. Like, you would never, ever get through all the X-Men, right? And one week I was yeah. watching, and I was, like, reading all their powers, and I was like, oh, I wonder what, like, they're going to say about Magneto. And then they cut right before it, and I was like, what the heck? And I was like, well, they used to it in the original. And then they just go to, like, this weird, like, image of just the X-Mansion. Right. So I think it's an intentional callback to, like, the original cartoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, makes sense. Oh, I know it's kind of originally from the original, but I thought it was kind of like maybe they cut it soon because you oh, know, gotcha. to have hit the weight of like these because it also didn't. I didn't think it showed Rogue as well, but maybe it just like didn't. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, yeah. So shoot, I, I how do we how do we go from here? Do we want to go into our favorite parts well that was criticism yeah so i guess we didn't discuss the episode beat by beat we kind of got through everything i yeah let's go through just favorite parts favorite parts maybe a scene or two they want to talk about criticism and see if there's anything left on that so what is your favorite parts of this episode um i mean that final fight scene is is epic and in- incredible mm-hmm. um it was a little quick but i have a sneaking suspicion because uh we had a cable sighting I okay think it's, yeah it, it's tipping its cap it's like we're going to be coming back to this moment uh, i agree I so i don't think this is a really a, a podcast for morning we don't have to sit here and we don't have to to, to a, a, a lose our members like i think magneto we're not playing sarah mclaughlin it's yeah okay. I, I think we're probably okay we did see a heroic uh sacrifice and maybe gambit never comes back right maybe that's the end of that character oh what a great end to that arc right i think that's incredible yep. but we can mourn him after the fact but you're right cable showing up and saying he's coming and not again uh, also the fact that Bishop and time travel was like kind of alluded to two episodes ago. I just, I can't imagine. I think we do get some type of hard reset potentially coming off of this. Right. So that would be my only. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Live in the well, station I... for now, but like on a rewatch, you might be like, Oh yeah. They like fix things in like two episodes. So don't worry about it. Yeah. And, it, and it's mutants. We're and even if let's say they don't save everybody and everybody still stays dead. There's always ways for them coming mm-hmm. back. Like, this is a world of apocalypse where he can just be like, I like this character, I'm resurrecting them. Or we have Sinister, who just happens to really like cloning people. So, hmm. who knows? People never stay dead in comics. There's literally, like, thousands of ways for these characters to come back. Um, I'm I'm leaning time travel. Um, I'm thinking yeah. it now. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I definitely think we're going time travels. But, yeah, my favorite part um, is that... Is that how when they went for it like mm-hmm. we always preach on the show we want people to like we want ambition and to we we strive for that so when it comes to videos or video games or movies or tv shows if people go for it and try to be ambitious they sometimes don't always need to nail it but gosh darn when they do it's so delicious and this was this was amazing i was so happy to get it but uh what's that's my favorite part what's yours i think just the yeah the depth of storytelling that was uh conveyed in this episode right from everything to every kind of everything we get at the genosha right the introduction to a lot more characters right uh we're seeing glimpses of maybe who's coming who's uh, potentially characters in the future, right? Like Emma Frost has been thrown around a bunch. Well, we kind of got the reintroduction of her, right? Uh, mixing up the team. Uh, I really enjoyed that. And I mean, you have to give it to the final battle, right? Rogue Gambit yeah. and Magneto fighting against this kind of insurmountable odds, trying to save lives and failing, failing kind of miserably, right? Uh, lots of times shows yeah. are safe, right? We don't get to see our he- heroes make bad moves and fail. Uh, we talked about this, I think, with the original Star Wars movie. Why do we love those original Star Wars? Like, why are Han, Luke, and Leia so great? Because they're terrible. They're awful. They fail all the time. Like, they're not good at anything. They go to Cloud City, they get captured. Luke loses, like, Luke goes to show up, he loses his hand to Darth Vader, right? Like, they're worse for wear all the time. And that's awesome. That's what you want to see is you want to see people at their lowest. We've seen the X-Men now at their lowest, right? We've seen them sacrifice. We've seen them dead. This is a low point and they've created what an awful situation. I was absolutely gutted on Wednesday. I had a longer day at work, came home, wasn't feeling great. Watched that episode and then just having to live in this world of the aftermath of what happened, what I had to watch my favorite characters go through was absolutely just an absolute gutting, demoralizing experience. And that's pretty incredible to get from this like children's cartoon, essentially, right? So just the the, the depth and the brevity and the the ability to kind of I don't know leave us in this dark pit of despair and not give us a feel good moment, right? Yeah, it, it's great, and it's one of those things where 
you kind of have to learn about loss, right? I was thinking about that from a kid's point of view. They might say, oh, it's kind of mature storytelling. But who's okay with this? Like, when am I mature enough to watch this story and not feel absolutely just, just gutted and just crippled with what I've seen and, like, the loss of the Magnetos and, like, the destruction of these mutants? When am I mature enough to see that? So why can't we have children, right? Uh, maybe, like, young, young children. But at a certain point, you have to start learning how to deal with grief and loss and, and despair, mm -hmm. And these are big concepts to learn. So I don't know why we shelter children from these stories. Some of the greatest stories I remember as children, right? Like remember watching, I'm sure you saw Terminator or something, Terminator 2 when you were younger, probably younger than you should have been. What a cool epic story that was. And you're like, wow, I learned about emotions today. I, I think this storytelling shouldn't like... I don't know, I think we shelter our children probably a little bit more than we should. Uh, and something like yeah. this, one of these challenging narratives that like pushes you and like makes you feel things uh, is is incredible, right? And it's one of those things where I, I don't know how to deal with it. I'm an adult and I'm sitting here and I'm like, I don't know how to deal with the grief and loss that I've, I've suffered this week after watching this episode, right? So the fact that they've kind of brought us to this low point, they've shown us essentially a 9-11, a Holocaust, right? This horrific, horrific event is pretty darn special and cool. And I'm like glad that they had the, the, the depth, the brevity to get to this point, right? To make us, give us this low point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I have a th an issue with the, I, I like, I'm a, maybe I'm a softy, but I like, I, like stories, like this is a great episode and reading online that this was like, oh, this is the X-Men Red Wedding. I was yeah. like, I am dreading watching this. It's okay. like, I, I, I was kind of like, I was kind of dreading it, to be honest, because the Red Wedding, everybody's like, is that a good Game of Thrones episode? I'm like, it's kind of like, and I, I guess I'm, I'm, it's me, like Red Wedding's mean spirited. This is a devastating, dark, sadder tale that deals with like loss and stuff, but it's not mean spirited. Yeah. And I think that this handles that, the subject matter extremely well. And after I was done, I didn't feel like, like malice or anything about like, man, I really screwed this up. It's like, no, I think that they handled this so well. It was very um, eloquently done. It like these, these tragedies are heavy hitting, but you don't feel that it wasn't like things weren't earned. Like yeah. or things that like ever, all this was kind of earned and set up and you, it's believable. And I think they did all the characters justice Yeah. as, and I, find that like i don't think the red wedding did a lot of characters a lot of justice it was kind of just but that's the point of that yeah, episode it's supposed so, to subvert to what, expectations what, and just yeah yeah so so when when i was watching this and people were making that comparison i was just like oh no i was kind of dreading it mm. and then after i watched it, i was like oh no this was this is infinitely better than the red wedding this handled uh essentially a terrorist attack um yeah extremely well and it does it with grace and respect and it, with the certain amount of like impact that that uh, event would carry. And hearing the writer um, kind of break the silence and give his like kind of background about it really did add the context of like, oh, no, the, like this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's almost like, hey, when you ca care about the characters you're writing about and you're trying to tell an actual interesting story and say something... I think that um, you can do a lot with a, minute, a lot of things, and yeah, this was just top notch. One of one of the best episodes of TV I've watched in a long time. Yeah, so no, it, I was stoked. It, it the only okay, cool, and then uh, that's kind of a good praise from both parts. Like, there's things I'm missing. Maybe we should discuss a little bit more during the recap, but it, it is what it is, right? So. Uh, let's get into like our least favorite part. So you have like a least favorite part for myself. I would just say the fact, the pace, it's both kind of a positive and a negative, the pace that this show moves, right? The fact that we got Madeline Pryor back in the show, uh, an episode afterwards, we we're like, what is Madeline up to? What is she? Oh, she's just going to be on this council. Oh, she's just going to be destroyed in this giant blast in Genosha. And then she's dead. It just seems like everything moves really quickly. Now, ultimately, like Tyson alluded to, 
does this story kind of get reset and and, and we, we we get a recontextualization and characters are saved that died right and we get a different resolution to this potentially right uh that's a very very yep. strong uh probably what's going to happen uh but just like the pace of how everything moves it's and again both a criticism and a negative i would have loved to see them just live on genosha for a couple episodes take it in hang out with nightcrawler but the fact that we get all compressed into like two or three minutes it almost just doesn't seem like there's enough right and ultimately at the end of this epi- this series am i just going to be wanting more and i might be but uh, it, it's just and i don't know if it's a negative so much like it's a criticism just as like this show moves really quickly but they do it so well you're just like you almost don't hate it yeah but i kind of hate yeah. that i don't get more of it you know what i mean yeah it's a it's a it's a sh- the, the only shame is that these things are like 32 34 yeah. 35 minutes long this, it's like this could have been the this end could be, of season this could one. be like hour long yeah and right. like you, there's a lot of material here and I, it's so it's so funny that like there's so much material here where you're like wow like we're getting so much so fast like the mm-hmm. the pace is too is too fast whereas man most most shows would kill for this kind of content where it's like man we could make 12 seasons out of this mm-hmm. it's like yeah you probably could because um you could spend a little bit of time in genosha and figure out why there are ten dollar apples and that's that like, honestly people like i was saying when i saw that gambit's like oh these apples are like ten dollars seems like something suspicious is going on i assumed there's gonna be an episode of him about learning about like smuggled apples or something that's what I thought the episode would be. And I was like, this yeah. episode is going to be stupid. And how wrong was I? Uh, do you have a negative? Do you have like something, a criticism, something to say, something to pick apart? Because like mine was pretty lame. Is yours better? Yeah, uh, um, Moira. Okay. I, I I hate her as a character. So seeing her dead didn't satisfy me the same way that, you know, if she was in every character and died like Kenny, like mm-hmm. South Park, I, I'd be okay with that because okay. I hate this character. Um they rewritten her um and i guess i can kind of get into it because i i have a bunch of notes kind of on this kind of topic because she why is a human on the council it's like and she honestly gets more lines than kind of even banshee they are making a really big point of mentioning her or bringing her up and it's like don't do this to me don't do this to me because so I don't know if everyone, like maybe you don't know about Moira. So Moira is a human that got rewritten to a human sentinel that got written into a human sentinel mutant um, because her character powers are essentially she has like, she can just regenerate a new life. Um, she's in, um, um, uh, invisible to any like mutant detection. She has a genius level intellect and essentially they just made her like the big bad in the comics and it just pissed me off to no end where it's just like there'd be big plays where you think that maybe this is like Sinister's plan but nope turns out it was Moira and they just did that for freaking like years in the comics recently um, and actually it was the reason why I stopped reading it so seeing her gives me trauma and I hate her hmm. um, so you're coming into this with baggage and... uh, baggage yeah I am this is my baggage showing All but right, hold on, I'm pause. also like I'll be right back yep. sorry we had a Amazon pickup. No worries, no worries. Um, <laughs> All right, sorry. But, uh, we took a pause. So, Dyson, uh, Moira is your least favorite part just from the character y- that she comes from yes, in the past. Well, and so a lot of the character designs is kind of similar to the Age of Apocalypse. Um, and guess who's married to Bolivar Trask in, in Age of Apocalypse? Moira. Okay. Um, so... If they make Moira the traitor of this who actually set this whole thing up because she knows that she could easily just die and resurrect herself, it would just would just piss me off to no end. And I, I, I literally wrote a whole paragraph down here about this would be the worst idea. And I'm I'm not gonna read it, but that's my that's my that's my rant, my rave. Okay. If Moira did it, I'm gonna be so upset. I would probably base on just the fact that you could look at I don't know if they're going to go into ancient history, right? Because there is so much uh, since the 90s that have come out in terms of characters and new storylines and enemies. I wouldn't be surprised if we see the series take a new direction and try and build some of the more modern type events. So I don't know if we're going to get a lot of focus on Moira. I mean, they were probably just like, uh, who's like an ally? Who's like the only human ally to mutants on the planet? She does not need to be there. I'm just saying, literally... Why introduce this character? Um, 
So that's yeah. Because okay. she she is a modern character. This this modern rendition of Moira, it's like that's that's a very Disney thing she, to do. Because she existed so. pr- prior to that, though, I don't know if that's yes. an issue, right? Because like you kind of have to look at the continuity of the comics. They can introduce new stuff going forward, but I don't know if they're going to like alternately like change certain characters backstories oh, right oh so. yeah that's but the problem with moira's backstory is that that's this is the new canon is nothing's changed this is just quote unquote additive yeah. so i i fear i fear things because um the other other thing is like want to get into a little predictions about maybe what's to come predictions or, I, or do you want, you I, want to go, I, go in another direction i don't yet. think it's worthwhile predicting anything just sit back for the ride i would have told you that based on the narrative they were telling with babel baby nathan and bishop in the future i assumed we were going to be getting a season long arc of oh nathan is cable but two episodes later they're just pretty much blatantly saying oh cable yeah he was your baby from the future uh, stuff happens don't worry he's cable now and they've just progressed right so whatever you think is going to happen they can make giant leaps and jumps and it's almost just one of those things I think you just got to sit back and enjoy the ride and don't get too bogged down with like, ooh, are they going to introduce a Zorn? Oh, is Zorn? Masked, masked magnetic man Zorn? Is he going to show up? Is uh, what's Charles's... Well, I, 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 I have some... Yeah, Cassandra Nova. Cassandra Nova. Charles. Right, and you're that, like, ooh. That's, that's been thrown around. Isn't she the um, villain in the new Deadpool movie? And don't we see... Uh, comic book accurate wolverine and stills with deadpool right now is there some tie-in yeah uh well i mean i i was kind of also going just based on the evidence that we have um because so the next the major three that's coming out or the next one is what life death part two and then we get so that'll be tolerance's the... extinction oh no, there's an episode no bright no eyes we have, in the middle. We have bright eyes yeah. bright eyes right of course because Oh, a little small note. So, who got called Bright Eyes? Why? What's what's the reference of Bright Eyes? Do you know? I, I looked it up. I know Cyclops. No, uh, it's when Rogue meets when they all meet Cable for the first time. Mm. That's what Rogue calls Cable. It's Bright Eyes. And then when um, Madeline Pryor sees Cable, it's like, oh, it's your eyes. It, it's you, Nathan. It's like, I did. I was wondering. So. I, I did Google it, and it's like Scott does something. I imagine that. Yeah. It, Time travel shenanigans are probably coming into play at some point, though. So yes, predictions, yes. like, feel free to predict. Uh, for myself, I'm not going to throw anything out there because it's, I don't know. What's going to... Did uh, the opening scene before the gala, we did witness the Watcher. So if you're looking at the sky, you see Watu, Watu yep. the Watcher watching. Uh, from the What If series, we know that the Watcher enjoys kind of nexus point events big events that kind of have multiple what ifs essentially right so potentially that event is going to be altered in the future right so i wouldn't be surprised if we see a what if episode in the future and then we know that what if ties into the mcu and the x-men are somewhere in the mcu so like wow they the the trailer for the next episode does show a certain shield of a captain variety so 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 exactly so it could get a lot messier before it may not just be a contained cute little universe they might be exploding into the live action itself i i don't know what's going on right so uh yeah uh, for yourself do you have any predictions if you want to do them feel free but yeah I, i'm yeah. gonna hold uh, off because it predicts expect the unexpected um i'll do predictions and then i'll run through my easter eggs and then i have a list of deaths if we want to do that um but my Quick predictions, Bright Eyes, it's a Cable episode. Um, and then the like that's that's kind of all I have for that one. Then there's the Tolerance is Extinction, kind of caught my eye. Um, there's a comic about Bastion, the villain, you know, that picture with Forge, um, where it's Operation Zero Tolerance, which is also kind of interesting. Um, so it's like there's some tie-ins there. I feel like they might be dying, diving into it. I'm not going to go into it. There's a few interesting characters that keep coming up like valerie cooper and forge and mm-hmm. it's kind of the answer to onslaught who hmm. but if magneto is dead and charles ain't around how can there be an onslaught so who knows who knows i those things are po- poking around and then um but obviously it's like uh it was a green shot that killed everybody who did we see in episode two that was using green shit it's sinister it's always sinister Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that's so. That's my fun little predictions. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I, ass- right. I assumed it's going to be like a combo of sinister and apocalypse. Yeah, somebody. It's like, like as soon as Cable showed up, I'm like, oh, it's because it's in the age of apocalypse. This is like an event. Why, you know, 
uh, yeah, w- right. So or, that- or, or I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's like Cable in the future, and we see the Horsemen of like Magneto and Gambit, and sure. like yeah, some yeah, who knows? But um, yeah, okay, cool. I'll go through my Easter eggs real quick. So we saw Glob, saw Pixie, saw Leech, saw Loa, saw Rainboy, saw Slick. Saw Multiple Man, saw Dazzler, saw Exodus, which was a cool one. Yeah. Uh, saw Frenzy, which was like his dancing partner. Uh, Tommy, the rainbow chick. We saw Cypher, we saw Nature, we saw Boom Boom, we saw the Watu covered that part, and Archangel. Um, so that's like little people hiding around the back. Mm-hmm. Um, but my list of deaths, real quick, of kind of confirmed ones. Uh, we got Gambit, obviously, Magneto, Morlocks. Callisto. You would say Gambit or Magneto is confirmed? It says uh, Omega level threat eliminated. So who's so who's on his I don't, chest? I don't, I don't. Who's on his chest when he dies or as the blast Le- hits? Leech. What is Leech's power? To absorb powers. So if... Episodes, that's what I would recommend doing. We're going to do the same thing for this show. So at the end of every episode, we're giving five, uh, ranking our top five mutants. So you get five points if you're the number one mutant, and you got one point if you're the number one. I've got a big spreadsheet. I've got a bunch of lists. And then afterwards, we'll sort everything. And we'll see who ultimately became the winner of X-Men 97. So in this episode specifically, Tyson, who do you have at number five? Um, I have Emma Frost. Emma Frost. Okay. Yeah, I don't think she she's probably not on your list. Nope. Um, but she's on my list because love to see my girl. Um, she's stirring the pot and she's definitely creeping in on what Gene and Scott are up to and Madeline's up to. She's definitely keeping an eye on that. Um, yeah, t- which t- makes t- me laugh. And then she called up Moira. So yeah, nice. Uh, so as we Double alluded points. to, when madeline and scott are having kind of their psychic connection it's actually during the council meeting and as she snaps out of it everyone says oh madeline what's wrong and emma frost kind of has a little smirk on her face alluding to potentially her infiltration of the x-men her future relationship with scott cool awesome for myself i have the man himself i have scott summers number one he actually has some type of autonomy he shows that he cared about his baby going back to madeline after all this time and comforting the mother of your child yeah she's a clone and it's awkward maybe you should have kept gene in the loop sure the fact that I gave him, I discredited him uh, back in episode two when he walked out on, or episode three, sorry, when he knocked, walked out on Nathan saying, like, you can't walk out on your child. The fact that he is showing that he does have um, some regrets uh, and he's more complicated. I was like, I have to give my man some props. So kind of post posturously point giving from previous episodes. Again, I will give Cyclops one pity point in this episode. Who do you have at number two? Uh, I got Rogue. Rogue. Okay. Wait, where you, I got? I'm going five to one. Yeah, I'm also going five to five to one. So four, four is four is Rogue. Four oh. is Rogue. She's my. So I have my uh, rankings, but in my spreadsheet, I also have like the point total, so that like my uh, spreadsheet will just gotcha. populate. So I saw the two, and that's uh, why I said it. So who do you have at number North. four? Rogue. Okay. Rogue. Right. Uh, she has. Uh, she's probably also on your list. I'll wait. No, she's not. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um kind of a main character on this one mm-hmm. kind of her trying to decide between the two lives that she wants to live um i think that the voice actress does a really good job i called her out in an earlier episode and i actually was going to call her out due to a line that she said during the 
I think in the Blackbird. So she's a little bit uneven, but her performance right near the end yeah. really made you kind of just she had to rank. Mm-hmm. Like she had to rank. This Very... I feel like Rogue is gonna had a, had a really rough day. Yeah, strong, conflicted, lots going on with Rogue in this one. At number four, I have Nightcrawler. Uh, he does kind of make an epic save on uh, Magneto and Rogue actually saves them from a full blast. Gets a little bit of the blast himself, uh, but just getting to see him be a bit more comic accurate in this. He's a bit more jovial. He's a bit more fun-loving. He's not a stoic. He's less religious in this episode. Uh, just seeing Nightcrawler come back into the fold, I was like, absolutely great. Uh, but he did not do anything great enough for a higher ranking. So who do you have at number three? Uh, this is where I got Scott. Hmm. So, uh, that, that, that one line alone about, like, you're lucky that we aren't uh we aren't like you because you wouldn't be here it's like damn truth bombs nice okay love to see it uh do you have who, Jean, who do you got at number three i have Jean gray oh, okay i don't have her on mine okay uh she's a little higher maybe could flip her with nightcrawler she does less actually i'm gonna do that right now yep sorry Jean gray you're actually number four oops nightcrawler you move up to number three good job buddy Jean Grey. uh why is she on the list just to begin with at all uh because we see just I thought her use of, I don't know, being in the lake, controlling her powers, uh, the whole love story, pushing it forward with Wolverine, right? Uh, seems like it's going in a different place. I don't know. I, I was very interested with kind of what was going on with the Gene Scott, Logan, love, uh, mm. Madeline love triangle, mm. right? Uh, seeing her yeah. kind of step out into the astral plane, getting to step up stand up right sometimes my rankings aren't just about the mutant powers it's about how the characters act uh and her kind of getting to step up and just be as conflicted as everyone else in that love triangle maybe even add some more juice right getting a little uh smoochy smooch with wolverine that is why she ranked number four on my list so nightcrawler was I better think, I, figured. I think yeah like and she doesn't probably get a lot of love but because it's like no she she's extremely pissed at scott because mm-hmm. she is feeling like she has to be like loyal to a guy that she doesn't really in love and maybe she wants to pursue a, a, a life with logan and maybe scott would be better suited with gene but these two just are forced together because that's the way it is there you go uh, who do you have like at number two i got magneto i got magneto uh you know the him doing that final stand mm-hmm. and like he's such a force of of to be reckoned with and you know he's kind of a pompous ass but he's throughout it but you know he just kind of literally got elected king everything seems to be going the his way even though it's not you know not not the way he originally did things mm-hmm. but everybody still respects him and it's like I think even Gambit says, like, what's all the deal with everybody, like, really digging into, uh, like, into Magneto? How come uh, Magneto became uh, mutant number one or mutant MVP or something? Mm -hmm. And it's like, he's kind of the face of the the mutant race right now. Um, He's, like, has to deal, like, he just essentially is going to be the new leader and then sacrifices himself um, on his principles and has an epic one, like, final stand that I think is, like, it takes the like it's so well done that it just takes the wind out of your your lungs. You're just like, damn man, like holy fuck, Magneto just went down. We are dealing with some shit right now. So nice. Um, he he. Oh, I I should have waited and said because he's probably on your list. Who do you have at number two? I also have Magneto. So yeah, no, we we're okay. we we're tied there. Yeah, uh, he has. It, it's very calculated, right? Him kind of getting to take over this um mutant nation right uh, kind of his dream is now being fulfilled right he's in charge of this very powerful group known as the x-men that are kind of renowned he's doing everything really well if you believe that maybe magneto was a bit more cold calculating maybe he's the bad guy i don't know like it, he's a really bad good villain right like if you found out that ultimately magneto was working with like apocalypse to, to try and create this world where they could have kind of free for all and use their powers willing or as against humans. It's a pretty good way of doing it. Right. So uh, lots of depth, lots of brevity. He has some excellent speeches, his flashbacks. You see kind of his time of like this, essentially him being reminded of the Holocaust as he's watching all those people die. uh, And just his final last stand, right. Uh, Incredible stuff from big butt buff beefy daddy. Not only that, I kind of think he ultimately saves the day. Due to his more intensity, his stricter training, his is more uh, uh, helping the X-Men kind of unlock more of their powers. Does he not kind of help lead to the climax of the show? Um, Does he not kind of maybe help people reach 
higher potentials does he not maybe unlock certain things when he trains them that we've seen in the past in the comics so like i alluded to last time this intensity of training this greater strength these greater feats i kind of think that maybe gambit couldn't have done what he did without magneto's intensity and training and i i'm gonna reward him whoa 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 (laughs) give credit to magneto for he didn't even want gambit on the trip but but what have we seen? Like, like any time like, he's ever he, been a part of the training. He just wanted him and Rogue to go. I, I think maybe originally, but I think his hubris and his obsession with Rogue and, and their relationship has clouded that. Because you're you're going to like, the like the, let's bring the X-Men. And all Magneto wanted to bring was like, me and Rogue. Hmm. That's the X-Men. And it's like, I feel like he doesn't care about the other ones. So oh, inadvertently. I feel but... like, I feel like gambit okay so let's earned that i, I like so because who's who's my number one i also have gambit so, yes yeah so Gambit being my number one i think the reason why he did what he did was a he has such crazy potential but he also loves rogue mm. more than anything mm. so his love for rogue was the reason why he could find that another level not because of magneto i'm not saying magneto's training wasn't effective because i feel like that's that's going to be showing in the in the future like, I feel like that's what Tolerance is Extinction mm. is going to be a lot of, like, the Magneto was right. We need to kind of, like, there's going to be a huge fraction. So I feel like he, that training is yet to be, pay off. So I think you're right still. But I think that Gambit's, like, that depth he found and the ability to just nuke a kaiju sentinel was because of his love for Rogue. Okay. That's what I think. Interesting. That's I, what, that's what that's all. Yeah, I see, I took that and I was like... I was like, oh, that was a pretty big move that we saw. And and yeah, sure, it could have been definitely a love for Rogue. But it, it alludes to that, like, look at these unlocking of the potential of the X-Men. It seems like it's a reoccurring theme. We saw it with Jubilee last week. We have now see it with Ec- with Gambit, right? So when we see these characters kind of do bigger and grander things, yeah, maybe it's... Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Now, again, also... Uh, five points or in our number one ranking five points 10 points in total because he cleaned up goes to gambit he was the main man he made the sacrifice play we saw a great use of his power we saw just tons of emotion tons of heart yeah. tons of anguish on this single-handedly thing. saved the day and saved the day and sacrificed himself right and we're gonna have that we have to live with that crushing moment of him being dead in rogue's arms uh for the rest of our yeah. lives or until next week when cable comes and resets well two weeks in bright eyes when he like resets the timeline or something like that so, yeah, yeah. Who knows what's gonna happen? Um, dang, but like, what a what an episode! What an episode! I I didn't expect this from this series. I was, we were, we were kind of like, oh yeah, we'll just do this because it's a fun little thing. And yeah. then it was like, holy moly, what a what an absolute beast of an episode! Good writing, solid. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit too quick pace, but I, I like I, I think I like know. that final that final battle happened so quickly. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I I just know we're coming back. I just know we're coming back. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, so it's good. So it's it's, it's uh, short lived, but we'll see. Uh, hopefully, they don't take away too much of the the, the devastation, the low points of this story, right? Because um, that would be kind of unsatisfying, just because it did take us to such a low, low point. But I, I'd also be like, I mean, that makes sense why you wanted to make things happy again. Because oh boy, was that dark, right? So uh, we'll see yeah. going forward. Um, I don't know how what where does this go right next week we're probably getting a storm centric episode so we'll get her back into the fold and then probably carry on with this kind of intense storyline from there yeah yeah i'm i'm excited i'm ready to buckle up Mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know what uh kind of else to say besides i'm looking forward to next week and yeah no should be good should be good um sweet so with that i'm i can't i can't believe it's so good yeah with that uh, we'll probably be back i don't know wednesday uh probably thursday maybe friday saturday i don't know some point next week to discuss uh, episode six life death part two so we'll see the conclusion of what's going on with storm and forge and th- who knows that might even unlock a whole nother bag of tricks right we get forge on the x-men building crazy stuff good times good stuff just like this episode so awesome so see you guys next week yeah see you then okay bye <laughs>